Hi, y'all, and welcome to tonight's live stream. When the prosecution found the Walt the Dog letter in Corey Richens jail cell, that was bad. When Corey Richens talked about it to her mother, that was worse. But what she says about it to her brother, that's the worst of all. That's what we're gonna be talking about tonight. So happy Saturday, everybody. I hope you're in the middle of a really great weekend. This is a bonus live stream we're doing tonight. There is so much to cover. I could not fit it into our regular Monday, Wednesday, Friday, 7 p.m. Uh, live schedule. So we are doing an extra. We are going to take a peek into a conversation between Corey Richens and her brother. And it's so hot, I just, I couldn't wait. We just need to go ahead and get it done. Now, next week, we're going to be talking about the Dan Markell trial. We're going to be talking about Dan Markell was murdered, and the person on trial is his brother-in-law, Charlie Adelson. So we're going to be starting that. The trial itself, jury selection begins on Monday, and the trial starts after that. So we will be covering that in detail, and it is a wild case. You absolutely want to hit the subscribe button because you do not want to miss that case. And if you would, while you're at it, please hit the like button. That will really help this video get out to more people. The Corey Richens story is absolutely filled with irony. You've got the fact that she was mixing her husband a cocktail and taking it to him in bed versus the prosecution says she laced it with fentanyl that killed him. And you've got that she went to be with her child who was having a nightmare at night and the prosecution says it was just giving her husband time to die. You've got that she wrote a children's book about helping her children get through the grief of losing their father, and the prosecution saying the only reason they lost their father is because she killed him. That irony must have been lost on Corey Richens because when officials found a letter in her jail cell no nail far and wide as the Walt the Dog letter, they believed it showed she was trying to tamper with witnesses, trying to send a message to her brother about what exactly he should say in order to help her when he testified in her murder case. But she claimed it was just another novel, and she has doubled down on that claim and made it even worse. Today, we're going to listen in on that conversation between Corey and her brother, Ronnie. It's not an actual audio. We have instead a transcript, which the prosecution filed in the case. They attached it uh, or referenced it as part of a brief. And so that's how we know it. And that's how we have it. In this conversation, Corey explains to her brother this infamous Walt the Dog letter. So we have her own explanation of this letter, and it could not get any more surreal. I am going to ask you all throughout, as soon as you start to have some impressions, let me know what you think. Is this making things worse for her? Is she making it better? You tell me. I really want your opinions. So this letter, the Walt the Dog letter, has already launched a paper war briefs, blame, flying back and forth. The defense lawyers say the prosecution should be held in contempt. The prosecutors say what the defense lawyers did could be considered a crime. So they are fighting tooth and nail over this letter. It's that important. Now, the defense lawyers might, maybe, possibly have been able to keep it out. For sure, they would like to, but Corey Richens keeps talking and it's getting harder and harder. The problem with this letter is that it casts doubt on her credibility, and not just hers. It also casts doubt on the credibility of all the witnesses that she puts up. And so that's what we are going to be talking about today, this letter. Now, I'm going to give you the prosecution say this is telling the witnesses what to say, specifically her brother, but there's also references to what her friends are going to say when they're interviewed on Good Morning America or similar shows. So I'm going to give you just like six sentences from it so you kind of get a flavor for the Walt the Dog letter. So let me make sure that I add the correct thing to the stage. Let's try that. Okay. 
So that is not <laughs> the correct thing. We will add something else to the stage. Here we go. This is the walk the dog letter. And you can see, it's not hard to tell why this would be called the Walt the Dog letter. Am I right? Because it states that in huge letters at the top. There's been much discussion over what it means, but Mama Pinks has looked it up for us and said she figures what it probably means um, based on slang is to get something, to pull something over on somebody, to overpower them or overcome them. So that may be, this is a letter, the prosecution says, from Corey Richens to her mother, Walt the dog. And note at the top that it says, but take vague notes so you remember. Now remember, Corey Richens says, this is a novel. She was just writing a novel. That's all she was doing. So why then would anybody need to take vague notes so they remember that? Somewhat confusing. So the in a phone call with her mother is where Corey Richens claimed this was just a novel she was writing. It wasn't a letter to her mother trying to coerce testimony from her brother. It was actually straight up a novel. She just was taking pen to paper again and writing another novel. But it does describe her exact situation and uses the exact actual names of the people involved in her situation. Now, the prosecution and the defense don't agree on anything about this letter, not even how the state got the letter, which is strange. For example, the prosecution says this was, for, and this was based on an incident report from the jail, that this was a unit search of all of Unit Bravo, where she has a jail cell, and that it was found in an LSAT LSAT prep book because Corey Richens is studying to take the LSAT, hopes to go to law school. The defense says, no, it wasn't. It was in an envelope marked to go to counsel. Sky Lazaro is the name of her attorney, and they say that was written on the outside of the envelope. It was attorney-client privilege, and it said so. And on top of that, it was physically bound to the notes to counsel. So let's take a quick look at what it at what is said here in in this particular in the six sentences that I'm going to show you, just to kind of give you an overview. Okay, so this one says, "Here is what I'm thinking," and remember, this is to her mother. But you have to talk to Ronnie he would probably have to testify to this, but it's super short, not a lot to it. Okay, and the prosecution says that sounds more like telling somebody what to say. It doesn't really sound like a novel. So uh, the then comes, and then there's a description of exactly how Ronnie supposedly knows that Eric Richens, Corey Richens' husband, had a fentanyl problem or at least had a drug addiction. And Ronnie supposedly knows that. And it explains in detail how he knows that. Now, Eric, according to Curry Richens, has a drug problem. That isn't what she told law enforcement when they first asked about Eric Richens. Instead, at the time, she told him he had no drug problem. And the prosecution says he didn't. The problem was Curry's alone if there was a problem. But Ronnie, according to this letter, must must say to Sky Lazaro, all the names are used exactly, Corey Richens' attorney, must say that there has to be a link between Eric Richens and this Mexican ranch where he liked to visit and that supposedly is owned by the cartel, that this was important to Sky Lazaro as part of the defense. It may be real. That's sort of the frustrating thing. There are some indicators in here that there may be real facts around this, but because of all the drama surrounding this, it's going to be pretty hard, I think, for Sky Lazaro to make this argument on behalf of Corey Richens. So let's keep going to page two. So, um, and you can see here it says, Eric told Ronnie, Eric Richens being the husband, Ronnie being the brother of Corey Richens, Eric told Ronnie, he keeps them, his pills, um, drug pills, illicit drugs, um, in an allergy pill bottle in his work truck so I wouldn't find them. Ronnie never told me about the conversation, which is pretty telling. If the prosecution is right that this isn't a novel, then if Ronnie never told her about the conversation, how would she know about it? That doesn't even really make sense. Obviously, then the prosecution will say she's telling them, she's informing them about how they should testify. And that's where the prosecution gets this sort of thought. And it clearly is more, unless it's truly a novel, then the state has a pretty good point. 
Let's go to the next slide. She also wrote, reword this however he needs to, however Ronnie needs to, to make the point, just include it all. Prosecution says, that sounds like you're instructing somebody on what to say. Slide four, when you talk to Ronnie about this, meet up with him in person. I worry sometimes your house and phone are bugged. Maybe drive down to Salt Lake and meet him after work without Bree, which is the actual name of her brother Ronnie's wife. She says, tell Ronnie, don't overanalyze it. It was a quick two minute conversation, LOL. The state is saying, this looks like witness tampering to us. Now they say witness tampering, meaning not necessarily charged witness tampering because they have not yet put in account for this. And since they don't have proof that there was actually a communication of this to either the mother or to Ronnie, it may be difficult for them. We don't know really what they're going to do with this information. We just know they filed it. Their request to the court was that there be no contact between Corey Richens, her brother and her mother during the rest of the trial until the trial happens. And they're their argument was she's obviously trying to coerce testimony. She's trying to get them to say specific things. We're going to have to put a stop to that court. So that was what her request was. So then you can see on the next page, um, there is the take vague notes again. And then the final sentence I wanted to show you, or a couple of sentences, the infamous crest white strips section Will you buy a box of Crest white strips, open them up, put it in an envelope, and have Sky give them to me? You can tell her what's in the envelope. I'm sure she won't care. I'll make sure they can't be found in my cell, which isn't going real well for her right now. My teeth are yellow from so much coffee and tea all day. And then she note that she does say, I love you, I love you, I love you. Hang in there. We're getting there slowly. You're the best mom in the whole world, which certainly links it back to the mother. Now, as I said, the prosecution says she's trying to influence witnesses in the case. Now, there is a really bizarre twist or interesting twist, I guess I'll put it that way. Remember I said that the defense says this letter was found inside an envelope that was marked for Sky Lazaro, marked attorney-client privilege, that the prosecution should never, the jail should never have gone into this envelope and found this book slash letter in the first place. And the prosecution says it was sitting in a book that had nothing to do with attorney client privilege. There was, was not marked confidential and there's no reason why we couldn't have looked at this. She is after all in jail. I want you to hear quickly what her brother, not the same brother we're going to, about to read the transcript for. This is the brother DJ. I want you to hear what he told Good Morning America, a very strange twist on this about why she was not in her jail cell when they searched. DJ accusing the jail of misadministering her medication to get her out of the cell. And you say that they have messed up her medication six times? Six times. One time is an accident. Two times is... So a very strange story there. He's saying that the jail intentionally, that's what he's implying, mixed up her medications so that she would have to go to the hospital. We know she went to the hospital the day before that. They mixed up her medications and they did that so that the coast would be clear and they could look through her room and try to find this letter or some other item that they were looking for. Really strange, strange call or strange information. Now let's take a look at the transcript that I was telling you about. This is the transcript that is the conversation between Corey Richens and her brother. Now we start out on page two and I'll just kind of summarize this where she says, well, let's go ahead. So in this initial, in this initial document, I'm going to have to look down, I think, because this is too small for me. <laughs> I can't read from that far away. So Corey Richens in the initial part just says to I'm on restriction because of what they have found. I'm going to go ahead and then start on page two. And then I'm, this is Corey Richens. I'm on 30 days of lockdown, 23 hours a day, no commissary. And her brother says, for what? Like they have to give you a reason. 
And Corey Richen says for the paperwork, that's what they're saying. Let me make sure that I have the right, do I, yes, I have the right page for you. I'm working on several different things here. Uh, for, for what? Like they have to give you a reason. And Corey Richen says for the paperwork, that's what they're saying for my paperwork that they illegally found, which I wasn't hiding, but it, you know. And to me, that's maybe a problem for Sky Lazaro because she's saying she wasn't hiding it. So if she wasn't hiding it and wasn't, that sounds to me like she's saying it was not put in the letter marked attorney client confidential. It wasn't put there. And that's not at all what Sky Lazaro says is the case. In the motion to dismiss, let's switch over to that real quick. In the motion to dismiss, I have so many screens going on. All right, let's flip down here and make sure that showed up for you. It did not. Let's flip over here. Still working. Okay, there we go. So in, in this particular document, this is what the defense team told the court. They said, the police report also omits a critical fact, namely that the Walt the Dog letter was physically bound to notes from Ms. Richens to her counsel. This was not communicated to defense counsel until October 2nd, 2023, when defense counsel specifically asked about the notes during a Zoom conference with counsel for the state. In an email following the Zoom conference, the state confirmed the notes had the word sky at the top and were bound with glue as if ripped from a book, sorry, a notebook or legal pad to the six page Walt the Dog letter. Rather than finding the Walt the Dog letter, quote, hidden inside a book, close quote, the state apparently obtained the Walt the Dog letter through a potentially illegal search of Ms. Richens' documents, which were stored in an envelope titled Sky Lazaro Attorney Privilege. That is the what the defense was saying. So now here, though, what Corey Richens is saying to her brother is that she wasn't in any way trying to hide this document. Well, if it was confidential, if it was privileged, then why would she not have been doing that? That's part of what is considered necessary, that you have to try to keep documents confidential if they're, if they're in fact privileged. So we'll keep reading. Uh, Mr. Ronnie Darden, for your paper, what does that have to do with the jail? What does that have to do with your behavior in the jail? And Corey says, well, I guess the jail gets to do disciplinary action too, is what they're saying. The jail does disciplinary. Ronnie says, again, for what? Corey Richens in the court. And they're like trying to say like my paperwork was contraband. And Ronnie Darden says, contraband? Corey, yes, yeah. Like you stuck it in there? What the blank does that mean? And I mostly cut out all those. I missed one. And what I am sympathetic to Ronnie because contraband I normally think of as a physical substance that is banned. And he looks it up in just a minute, you're going to see and says that. But I will say I looked it up and the, the actual description under Utah law is broader than that for anyone within the jail system. So they, they tried to stack as many things on there as they could. Like there's three different they call them findings, and they're all, do I have you on the right page? I don't. I have to switch two pages. Okay. One more. Okay. Uh, contraband, like there's three different, they call them findings, and they're all, and Ronnie says, contraband means any item that is, that's relating in Audible, is illegal to be, to be possessed or sold. Corey says, yes. Ronnie, like, what the blank are you talking about? Corey, I know, I know, it doesn't make any freaking, hold on, hold on one sec. Oh, I don't know what she said. Anyway, I have no idea how one freaking relates to the other. And Ronnie says, it doesn't. Those piece of blank part city police told the jail what to do. And Corey says, yeah. And Ronnie says, that's what, that's what happened. And Corey says, that's what it comes down to. Well, and they just keep saying it's a letter. It was never a letter like it was part of, and I'll flip for you and flip for me. Sorry, that's taking me longer than it's taking you. Okay. Um, like it was part of a, just a minute. <laughs> there, a freaking book. There we go. Like it was never a letter. It was never in an envelope. 
or did you hear that? Did you hear that? She just said it was never in an envelope. She just said that it was never in an envelope. And I read to you where it said in the document filed by the defense counsel that it was in an envelope. So there's a contradiction here. It could be a problem. Ronnie says it was part of the book you're writing. Corey Richens. Yeah. So I was writing this book that so basically it's like everything that happened up until like the detention hearing, you know, and Ronnie says, yeah, Corey. Then at the detention hearing, I actually get out of jail, which did not happen for real in this case. So it's like a fiction mystery kind of book, you know, and that's her argument is that this was actually just fiction and it was exactly the same as her life right up until the detention hearing. And that's when it turned into fiction. And she even talks about it, including her father. But nothing we saw in those six pages included her father. Now, there is discussion about more people, who, more pages than what we have seen so far. And Ronnie says, yeah. And Corey Richens says, so me, anyway, me, changing for you and also changing for me. And dad, go to Mexico. I mean, it's like, it's, let me pull this down just a little bit. It's like this really long, like 60 something page book. And which I found kind of funny because I didn't really think a 60 page book was like all that long. <laughs> it's not going to be war and peace. We know that it'll be much more succinct than that. And Ronnie says, oh yeah. And Corey Richens says, me and dad go to Mexico and we go to the ranch that Eric stayed at. And then we find out, did I switch the page for y'all by the way? Yes, uh, that there's human trafficking. And then I and dad is trying to like find out like who sold it to him. And it was the guy in the kitchen. And then we're like, oh my gosh, we got it. We, we recorded it. Like Ronnie, this is how ridiculous this thing is. I'm not kidding. So then dad's like, oh, it's the guy from the kitchen. Like he just sold me some. And I was like, oh my God, there's human trafficking here. We got to go. Anyway, so we go back to cross the border. I get arrested because I, I was out on bail and not supposed to leave the state. I write you and mom like this letter from Mexico prison. And I'm like, get me out. Like, you got to come. Like all this stuff, you know, like da, 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 da. You got to tell them. And like, I can't believe this is happening. Which it almost sounds like if that was actually written in there, was she, does is she worried that it's going to read like she was asking her family to break her out of prison? Is there maybe concern in the prison? Are they adding extra lots to her cell? I don't know. Since we don't have the remainder of this book, it's hard to book. Then it's hard to know exactly what it means. So we'll keep reading. And then I got out of Mexico jail, and then and we'll have to change for both of us. Change for you, and change for me. Okay. The trial starts. And then I write about the trial who's testifying. Like they literally took that, those papers out of the story. And Ronnie says, Oh my God, are you serious? Corey? Yes. That's what I'm trying to say. It's a 65 page novel. They read the whole thing. And on the, and I find that really interesting because she covered the whole trial. And I'm just curious, did she have, you know, back and forth? Did she have cross examination of the witnesses? Did, is it written out how they would answer? And was the prosecutor any good at the trial or was maybe the prosecutor not so good? And it turned out the defense lawyer was way better. I was just curious if she can write her own books. Surely she made the defense lawyer better. And, and that's what I'm trying to say. It's a 65 page novel. They read the whole thing. And on the front of the novel, this is the worst part. On the front of the book, it literally says, these are true events that have happened in my life, but the but the statements, the events, or this is surrounding, it says something like, these are surrounding the events of my life, but the statements, the events, and the way that it plays out have been falsified for a fiction novel. It's caused, but I think they meant called, to hell and back. None of this can be used against me. This is only a book. She's saying all that is written on the front. And what is so important about this is now there's something to check because supposedly there are more pages out there and you're going to hear her double down on this in just a minute. There are more pages out there and those pages are going to be something that could be used against her potentially. And is this statement actually going to be on the book? Because she's now told somebody, 
this statement is there on the book and it gives them more and more things to check behind her and to see if oh, you lied about this and you lied about that and this was false. So that's why it's so dangerous that all of this happened. And I want to say thanks very much to Marlon. I appreciate that. And Crystal, I'll thank you in just a minute too. Thank you so much. Um, so, so they read the whole and Ronnie says, are you F serious? Curry says, yes, that is why this is crazy. So they read the whole book, but only took out the three pages that they sent to them, knowing that that's what it said on the front of it, knowing that I'm talking about going to Mexico with my dad I'm going to change it for you and change it for me. Um, oh, and Marlon, I'm sure my dad says, says hi back. Thank you for the greetings. And Crystal, thank you also very much. I appreciate it. And she goes on to say, they pick and choose, and it even talks about, like I said something. Oh, sorry. I think I skipped one, didn't I? Um, I have some more. She says that passed. Yeah, that's passed away. Like what? And Ronnie says, I have some more questions about that because yeah, it definitely does not read that way. Like at all, obviously, because they F, they pick and choose. I thought that was really interesting because Ronnie is basically saying, Hey, this didn't sound like a novel to me either. So wow, this is really interesting that it was really a novel. Tell me more about that. And Corey says, they pick and chose, and it even talks about, like I said something about, I want Sky to get me white strips or something like da, 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 da. And the thing is, so like I get locked down because I got like white strips in and like some, I put like, I don't know, some girl told me on me or something. Like, like I write this whole thing and then it talks about like the media stuff and I'm like, Oh my gosh, now I'm in Mexico prison. Like the media is going to go crazy. Like, so like some of it is like, so a lot of like the first six chapters are all like true, what like everything that's played out, you know? And then, and Ronnie says, yeah. And I just have a question. Is it just me? Or are we kind of losing the plot here? Because I didn't really understand any of those last two paragraphs it seemed like maybe this was just a way of dealing with that whole white strips issue because that strip that she asked to be smuggled in through the attorney's pouch was something that would be illegal for her to do, for her to smuggle in things she's not allowed to have in the prison and smuggle that in would create a real problem. And so I, you know, one of the things I would love to hear in, in an actual recording is Ronnie when he says, yeah, at the end of that. I just wonder if it was like, yeah. Or was it like, yeah. And I just am really curious. So thank you, Annie King. I really appreciate that. So the, and Tori goes on to say, the last of it is kind of all altered. And like, and I said, some of it's true, some of it's not. Like it's, you know, it's a book. It's a fiction book, like, and. Let me switch mine and switch yours. That's passed away. Like what? That can't be right. <laughs> We've got to be on different pages. No. Nope. Yeah, I'm not on the right page yet. Then I said something like, the media is going to go crazy. Like you have to tell. I don't remember who I said. Somebody about doing like media. So she's trying to explain here what she had to say about her friends going on shows and what they would say. And she's going to explain it as all part of the book. You have to tell, um, and like in Audible have posted like this picture of the kids. So I was like, you posted that, like, this is crazy. Like get me out of prison, blah, blah, blah. It is this long, long thing. And that's what they nitpicked. So what they're saying is what Corey Richens is saying is that, she had, she's now trying to deal with this section of it where she talked about posting pictures. She said to her mother something about it would really upset Katie, coincidentally, Eric Richens' sister's name. It would really upset Katie if we posted pictures of her daughters or if we sent that out to the media and it got posted worldwide, if it got included in some of these articles. And she made a statement that sounded like she was saying, 
even if it shows my boys with her girls, it would really upset her. That's what it looked and sounded like to me from what she was saying. So I think she's trying to deal with that in this as it was just part of her book, just part of what she was writing. Again, it's not real cohesive right here, how she explains it. Ronnie says, do you have like all the other pages? Shouldn't have asked that, but he did. And Corey says, yeah. And Ronnie says, does Sky know this? Corey, yeah, I told her, I gave it to her. So there's like nowhere to run, nowhere to hide for Sky Lazaro. According to this, Corey has laid it all at her feet. There are more pages and Sky Lazaro has them. So that is going to play prominently because the prosecution is now saying we want those pages. And Sky Lazaro is saying, I'm not giving you anything more. I'm not giving you anything that you don't have. I think it's all privilege. So that's going to be a battle that gets fought over this. So uh, then Ronnie says, oh, my God. Tori says, I know. I gave it to her and I showed her the front of it. And it was all in my sky folder. This is different from what she had said earlier. Remember how she said it wasn't in an envelope? Uh, in my sky, which was an envelope, it wasn't a folder, all in my sky folder because I didn't know how much I can say. And the reason I say that I think it was an envelope, not a folder, is because there was a photograph of it attached to one of the defense motions. Like, I don't because it's all just some of it's true, some of it's not, some of it's altered. Like, it's just I didn't know what I can and can't say, like in this book, you know. So obviously, now, one of the things I think that she's attempting to do here is to make an argument that this is privileged, that she was showing the book to her attorney because she wanted to get advice on whether or not she would be allowed to write these things and that sort of thing. But it's that's not exactly the way that privilege works, because privilege is, a, is what applies to a communication between an attorney and a client. So there has to be actually communication between them. So any communications between them about whether or not the book could be written, that would be privileged. But she is applying this further than that. So it'll have to play out as the parties argue it. But so far, I have real questions about whether she's going to succeed in that, about whether Sky Lazaro will succeed in that. So I'm continuing down. Let's see. Uh, Ronnie says, yeah. And Corey says, it's fiction if I'm, and I'll have to change the page for all of us. Let me change your page. Okay. And then I said something like, I already read that. Mine is not changing when yours is. Okay, here we go. In a Mexico prison, and we're already going to trial. And he says she, Ronnie, and dad's alive. Like, Corey, dad's, Yeah. And so, and I have like all of the pages like bent, like, so they go together, you know, like it's very clear. And Ronnie says, uh-huh. And Curry says that these pages go like this is together. And on the front of it, it says like the title, the characters, like, because I didn't change. I, on the front of it, I had like, your name's Vinny. I don't know why, but I have like all the characters and then what their names are going to be changed to. But like when I'm writing, it's like confusing to think like, okay, wait, who was Stella? Who was, you know, Ronnie? Oh yeah, Corey, who was? So I use all them and then go back and change them to the names that are on the front of the freaking book. And it even says like the title. These are the chapters. These are the characters. Um, is She's trying to answer what I had said earlier about the fact that she used the exact same names of everybody and in a novel, you typically would adopt different names. You wouldn't just write out exactly what happened with exactly the same people who were involved. It's, that isn't really a novel. That's just maybe an autobiography. So she's saying that she had a legend at the front that gave different names to everybody. Again, pinning herself down because now whatever those pages are that Sky Lazaro has, those pages need to have this legend. And then the question is, do they? Do they actually have that? So we will flip pages for hopefully both of us. Ronnie says, are you F serious? And Corey says, nothing on this can be used against me. Like this is all a mystery fiction book. It's all inaudible. 
which makes sense because the girl said that they had checked my cell like six times. And one of the times they spent like two hours. And I was like, so they were reading through the whole book. And Ronnie says, yeah, they knew what the hell they had. Corey, yeah, Ronnie, they knew that it was a blank, blank book. Corey, yeah, Ronnie. And they're like, oh, no, no, this is, looks like it could be decrim. This looks good. Corey says, this looks good. Ronnie says, yeah, decriminating. Corey, yeah, I think he means incriminating. Ronnie, yeah, let's see this one. Oh, my God. So Ronnie is, I, I got to say, I, I, he is a, sounds like a pretty loyal brother. He sounds like he is right there with Corey all the way, ready to support her in whatever way. So that is, I think, in many ways, admirable. Although lying, of course, not so much. Corey Richens, but he hasn't, we, he hasn't testified. So absolutely can't be charged with having lied about anything at all. So that I know of. Corey Richens says, I know. That's why I'm telling you this is insane. There was never a letter. There was never a letter in a book, in an envelope. Like there was, like this was never a letter. Like what the F are you talking about? And Ronnie says, does mom know this? Curry, yeah, I told her, but she was like halfway listening. And I'm like, mom, I'm trying to, Ronnie, when did you tell her? Curry, a couple days ago. Oh no, the first day. I think it was the first day when I got locked down. And Ronnie well, she clearly was not listening because she has not told me that. She wasn't listening to you at all. I got tickled with that. <laughs> um, Curry says, I didn't think she was. And I'm like, mom, are you hearing what I'm saying? And she's like, yeah. So anyway, I'm like, oh my hell. So I didn't, I was like, okay. So I don't know if she told DJ, that's the other brother you saw in that video clip. I didn't know if she told you, I didn't know. But Sky has the freaking book. So we're back to Sky. Sky clearly uh, has the book, according to Corey Richens. And according to Corey Richens, there's more to it that we haven't seen yet, more than the pages that were shown to us by the prosecution. Ronnie says, no, nope, this is the first I'm hearing about it. Corey, yeah, it was pretty interesting, too. Like they go and we're like, dad and I, like we're hunting and we like the Mexican guys. We're up on the cliff and we have to pretend like, you know, like, how are we like Ronnie? It's such a detailed book. I'm not blank you like what the blank man is happening. And then like, then we find out Marco, the guy in the kitchen is the one that sells the pills and we get some from him. But then there's all these like 15 and 16 year old girls that are like getting human traffic because they have this like 4th of July party. And like, and Ronnie says, why did they have a 4th of July party? That doesn't make any sense. And again, I got kind of tickled at that because of course they're in Mexico, right? Why are they having a 4th of July party? And Curry, yeah, I know. And it even says in there, like we like Mexican, like we don't know if they're going to have a party. Like an Independence Day? That's Ronnie. And Corey says, because we're in, and let me switch pages for both of us. Like we're in Mexico, but Ronnie, oh, Corey, I just, yeah, because I had just gotten like released on the detention hearing and I wanted to get to Mexico like, right, ASAP. So it was like we were getting to Mexico like on the third and then like dad says, well, this will be perfect. Maybe they'll just celebrate anyway. And that's when like the party and drugs will come out. And I was like, okay, cool, you know, good idea. And then we find out that they really are having a party and like they bring in truckloads of beer and all this stuff. But really it's not just a party. It's a sale of like human trafficking girls. Like, and Ronnie says, yeah, very loyal. Corey says, and I write how like all the guys and women are dressed to the T, but then like they have these like, 15 and 16 year old girls with them that are like their makeup's running down their face and they're like, you know, like rocking back and forth. Like you can tell they're so drugged. And then I overhear a, and we will switch pages for both of us, conversation with some guy that says, hey, I'll give you 10 grand for that girl. And that's when I find out. Like it is really, Ronnie says, oh my God, no, dude, everyone is blowing. Apparently, I don't know. You know, I don't watch the news, but no, they are all blowing up about this. So he's referring to the fact that people have seen the Walt the Dog letter 
as a letter where Corey was trying to instruct her brother how to testify. And he's referring to that in the news media. Corey Richens says, yeah, like, and Ronnie says, so that's blank unreal. Corey says, like at one, you know, at some point, I hope Sky's going to say like what it really is. Ronnie says, I'm sure that she will. I don't think that anybody knew. Like mom told me this as I was going in to do, I was a little busy and I was like blowing up. And then I got, got a call from a record, reporter and I was like, I don't know what the blank you're talking about. Like I was kind of, I was pretty damn blank with them because they like instantly asked inaudible. I was like, how the blank do you even know about this? And she was like, well, they're talking. So switch for me and switch for you. I'm getting faster at this. Oh wait, went too far. <laughs> Speak too soon about this and this. And I was like, what are you talking about, dude? I don't know what you're talking about. Like I kind of, I got pretty blank with them. Corey says, uh-huh. And Ronnie says, but yeah, no, like apparently you're freaking, it's all over the damn place. So, I mean, that's real good now. I'm sure that Sky's going to come out and say it. And Corey says, I hope so. It's even like dated back to when, like, it just is so crazy how like out of context everything is. And Ronnie says, yeah, Corey. And it's like, oh, you took those pages, but you forgot the rest of it. Ronnie, well, duh. Corey, right. Like, Ronnie, yeah. No, it makes Sky's thing was actually really good. And it was like they, they, they did it illegally, first of all. Secondly, the gag order doesn't blank like it's already out in the public docket. It's already out in the public eye. Like they're trying to blank her. Switch pages for us, for me, and then for you. Entire trial. Curry, uh huh. Ronnie. Even if this comes out, you know, even when it comes out, it's being a book like, well, still like this is all they're trying to blank her entire trial to taint a damn jury. Corey, uh-huh. Ronnie. And it's obvious that's what they're doing. Corey, right. Ronnie, because they're that desperate. It's it's so it is unbelievable. Corey, and that thing you were looking for the other day, they did not do it. I'm telling you, it was not done intentionally. Ronnie, the thing I was looking for the other day, Corey, yeah, the inaudible. Ronnie, oh yeah, inaudible. Yep. Corey, they, Ronnie, they didn't do it intentionally. I am really mystified as to what this conversation is about. It's gotten very interesting. I wonder what on earth this thing they didn't do intentionally was. So we'll keep reading. And if anybody has an idea, Stick that in the comments because I'm mystified. I have no clue. Curry says intentionally did not do it. No, they did. Ronnie, they did intentionally, Curry, not do it. <laughs> this is this is like one of those who's on first scenes. Ronnie, they Ronnie says they did intentionally, Curry, not do it. Ronnie, you just said they did not do it. Curry, yeah. Ronnie, yeah. Curry. It was never done. That specific thing was never done. And they made sure it was never done intentionally. Aren't you curious? Like what? <laughs> Ronnie. Yeah, that is bonkers. Corey. Yeah. Ronnie. These darn forgot to uh, mark out these blank morons. Because if it was done, because if it was done, it would show, you know, Ronnie, that they blank up. Corey, what they blank. Sorry, what they, yeah. And Ronnie. Yeah, holy blank. Corey, yeah, I can't. Ronnie, no, she didn't. <laughs> None of that is super coherent right here. Hard to even know what they're talking about. Corey, huh? I'm with her on that. I have no idea what they're talking about. Ronnie, go ahead. Corey, oh no, I just, I knew she wasn't like paying attention when I'm like trying to tell her, but you know how she does. Ronnie, yeah, well, mom was... Mom was just on the phone with Skye and she said, you are not allowed to call her anymore. Corey, wait, what? Ronnie, mom was just on the, or mom texted Skye just saying, hey, this is what. Corey can't text for 90 days and do this, that, and the other, whatever, whatever. I just wanted to let you know. And I guess Skye told her she can't talk. She can't talk to her. I think, I mean, you can't talk to her on the phone anymore. You on the phone anymore. 
inaudible. Corey, what? She just barely said that? Ronnie, yeah. And I was like, yeah. And I was like, what did you say back to her? And I said, I was like, well, no, think again. She goes, I didn't do anything. But I, and let me just say, I have to say that if I were Curry Richens' lawyer, I absolutely, I would be agreeing with the prosecution's motion to prevent contact between Corey and her brother and her mother, because she, this is just creating nothing but trouble for Corey Richens. So I think the attorney would be very wise to do what it sounds like she's doing, which is saying, let's stop talking on the phone because it gets recorded and a lot of trouble results. He says, but I, mom, did not hear you worth a, and I will switch me and switch you. Damn. She definitely was zoning out when you said that. Otherwise, she'd say something if she's still referring to it as a letter. Curry, oh my gosh, it was never a letter. Ronnie, I know this is blank. Curry, well, you'll have to explain it to her. Ronnie, I am. I'm going to call her as soon as you get off the phone. And Curry says, well, it's going to hang up in a minute. So I just wanted to check in, tell her, Ronnie, well, cool, Curry, to don't freak out at Sky. Ronnie, I'm not, that's all. I was like, so she had like this whole thing she was going to write. I was like, no, no, no. Just say, nope, think again. Sky's going to file whatever she wants, but you can't tell a mother not to talk to her daughter. Who else is she going to talk to? all day. Corey Richens, yeah, I get it. And I do get it. I mean, I can't imagine being in that situation and not being able to talk to a parent. But on the other hand, this is creating significant troubles. And so I think it would be wise not to. Uh, Corey says, but all right, well, you can give mom a call. I'll let you go, Ronnie. Okay, I'm going to call her right now. Corey, okay, love you. Bye, Ronnie. Love you. Bye. So that is the transcript of the phone call between Corey Richens and her brother. And you can see some of the significant problems that are going to be created for the defense team because of the things that are said in that. It, it, this whole situation is not directly connected to the allegation that Corey Richens murdered Eric. And yet, it has a direct connection to her credibility and to the credibility of the witnesses for her side. And so that is going to make it super important. Now, I, I'm going to take a look over in the chat and see if we have some questions. So be sure to put some question marks at the beginnings so it's easier for me to see, but I will take a quick look through. Uh, Annie is asking me, can her family be implicated or charged if they actually do testify to these details at a later trial? Do you think the letter will be allowed at trial? Oh, Annie, such a hard question. So could her family be implicated for testifying? I don't think so because of the fact that they can be cross-examined with it probably. If that's the exact fact they say, then they could be cross-examined about that. But the problem is there's no indication that she tried to communicate it to them Instead, the state filed it, right? The way we know about it, the way the brother knows about it, it's the state filed it. And how does anyone know that isn't just coincidentally the truth? I think the problem comes with the, with the cross-examination because then it'll be, wow, that's convenient. Isn't this the exact thing that, you were, that she wanted you to testify to? And it undermines, as I said, their credibility. It makes them less believable. And that's where the problem is going to come in. So do I think it will be allowed at trial? I don't know. That is going to be a huge battle between the two sides. The prosecution is going to push for it to come in. The defense is going to, they've already begun saying that it shouldn't come in, that it shouldn't have been found, that it was confidential, that it is confidential, and that it even if it wasn't confidential, it shouldn't have been found. That where it was located was something that would have been confidential. But as you can see, Curry Richens' conversation with her brother is undermining the defense ability to argue that because it contradicts that in several places. So <laughs> I see Nettie saying I could substitute like for another word. <laughs> this is driving me crazy. I'm just reading the transcript. I'm sorry, but I get you. I get you. That is definitely an issue. So I'm looking through for questions and I'm going to then go back to the bottom on the theory that a lot of people may have saved them. How long was this phone call? Hmm. Let's see if we can tell. 
I don't think we can tell. It says audio concluded, but it doesn't give a time. Let's see if it's at the beginning. Nope, I don't think it doesn't tell. It probably wasn't really all that long. It turned out to be, it's about 25 pages of transcript, but transcripts are kind of at their every other line and it's probably not all that long, maybe 10 minutes or something like that, but that would just be a guess. I don't really know how long it would have been, but it's an interesting question. They haven't given us enough information. Now I'm going to go back to the bottom and see if people are putting in questions. What? No, oh, there's one. I was about to say, what? No questions. That can't be possible. All right. Let's, and I saw one just there. Let's go back up. Will her mom and dad, bro, be barred from communicating for the duration of the trial? No ruling on that yet. There has been a request from the state that there be a no contact order that Corey be prevented from communicating with her mother and her brother Ronnie for the duration until the trial is completed. And there hasn't been a ruling on that. Her side has vehemently opposed that and said, you can't, you can't rule that. That's not appropriate, that it would be unfair. So we know that that's going to be a battle between the two sides, but what we don't know is how the judge will rule. Uh, as I said, I, if I, did I mention that was from Tam? Um, thanks, Tam. And so if I were the attorney, I would specifically want her not communicating with them in any form that would be something that could be recorded and used against her, because I think it's just too risky. She's blowing things up right and left with the statements that she's making. She's throwing in lots of things for the prosecution to talk about later. In a case where, frankly, there's not a whole lot of specific evidence against her, there's very little of that. And so her attorney has a case planned talking about how little specific evidence there is about her. And the more they can ask the questions of her witnesses, make them look not credible, the more trouble that it will be. So I'm take one last run through what happens to Sky issue. <laughs> what? Oh, okay. What happens to Sky, the attorney, if it's proved that she brought in the Crest White Strips? I don't think it's been proven that there were any Crest White Strips. It was just that there was a request for that. In the Waltha Dog letter, the, she said, would you please ask Sky? I'm sure Sky wouldn't have a problem putting them in the envelope. Just go ahead and ask her. So I don't think that it actually happened. So I don't think Sky Lazaro could be any, in any trouble. And what would happen? I, I imagine it would just be something like they would, where there had been white strips brought in illegally, I imagine it would, be, it would just be something where they would in the future search that particular lawyer's items that they brought in a little more intently because they found out somehow that there was contraband being brought in. So that would just be my guess. Mary says, if Sky has all the evidence, why wouldn't she put it out there? I don't know that Sky has all the, I think what you, I, I think what Mary is asking me is if Sky has evidence that Corey did not murder her husband, why isn't she putting it out there? And I think it's less that she has evidence that Corey did not murder her hus husband and more that she has an argument that the state doesn't have much evidence that she did, that the evidence a motive is strong, but the evidence that she actually gave Eric the fentanyl is sort of weak. She was the only person there. She purchased the fentanyl. She mixed a Moscow mule, but they haven't proven fentanyl was in the Moscow mule. They do say from the autopsy that it was ingested, but there's not a direct line there. And I think that's exactly where they would have, would have fought it. I think that's where they would have argued it. So can the state get the 65 pages she wrote? They want it. <laughs> they want that 65 pages. And they filed a motion about it. And Sky Lazaro has said, I think this is confidential. I think this is attorney-client privilege. And the state even says, when we first found out about it, she said she would turn over other documents she had. Then she said, nope, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to turn those over. Having rethought it, I think that this is something that's confidential and I'm therefore am privileged and I'm not going to turn it over. And so at this point, she has not turned it over. And so uh, that was from Dominique. Thank you. And I see another question um, in here. Why would Sky not prove it's a book and show it? 
you, I mean, you have a good point. If there's a book, if there really is that legend on the front in where she named all of the characters with different names, if there were, and I think that was, that was from Chilo. Hey there. So, and if there were things like that statement on the front about this can't be used against me, this is just a novel. If Sky's name was at the top, all those things that Corey said in the comments to her brother, if all of that is there. Why not just show it? And I think the reason would be that there may be other things that could be a problem in there. The, the reason is that just as we saw in those few pages, so many things that the state can use against Corey Richens. I think the fear is if they show that entire 65 pages, if it exists, if that exists, if the whole 65 pages exists, then what will actually be, what will be shown to the prosecution. And I think that the defense is saying none of that should be shown because it's going to do nothing but get us in trouble. And that's why, that's why we're going to just keep it, keep it back. And uh, Marie is asking me about the folder marked attorney lawyer eyes only in, in the prison cell. And it appears that this particular folder was in the prison cell with Corey. And I'm, I'm guessing there's really not much else, much other place to put it. And you don't really have privacy in a jail cell, but obviously your communications with your attorney are supposed to be confidential. So I want to say um, thank you to the moderators, uh, Mama Pinks and Marlon. Thank you very much. And don't forget, we are covering the Dan Markell case starting on Monday. That's Dan Markell is an FSU law professor who was murdered for hire by a hitman. Three people have already gone to prison. Three people have been convicted. One is now being tried, Charlie Adelson. He is the brother-in-law of Dan Markell, or at least the ex-brother-in-law. His sister was, getting, was divorced from Dan Markell. And the state says Charlie Adelson, a dentist there in Florida, hired a hitman to kill his ex-brother-in-law. That is hotly contested. This case has been going on for years and years. And it is absolutely fascinating. It's going to be broadcast. You'll be able to follow along and we'll be able to talk about it at the end of the day. We'll do at least three times a week, but we may do more than that, depending on exactly how much content there is that I can talk about to you. The every the Monday starts jury selection. The actual trial won't start for several days after that, probably the next Monday. So We'll just get started with introducing the case on Monday. So be sure to hit the subscribe button because you are going to want to hear all about that. And also, if you would, please hit the like button and I will see you on Monday at 7 p.m. And thanks for watching, everybody. And I will see you then.